So, welcome to this tutorial. My name is um, Matthias Bernd. I'm bioinformatics service um, at the UFZ in Leipzig. So it's an environment research center, <clears throat> sorry. And we do a lot of meta barcoding studies. And in this tutorial, I want to show you how to do a meta barcoding study using Dada2 on Galaxy. So what it's all about, um, so we have a mixed sample like feces or soil or something like this. And we want to know what's in there, what kind of microorganisms live in there and how many of them, maybe under different conditions. So we have treated, untreated samples, or we have a time series um, analysis. So throughout this tutorial, we will use a data set from an earlier tutorial, actually from the mother uh, tutorial which studied feces of mice post weaning. Um, and they took a sample for every day and they wanted to know, okay, what happens after uh, post weaning? Um, does this change the uh, microorganisms in the feces, the gut microbiome? That's the uh, background of this uh, tutorial. So the data has been used previously in other tutorials uh, like the mother uh, MySec SOP, uh, that's where it comes from. So the first thing that we need to do is to get the data. So normally you would go to data on the top menu, go to data libraries. Then there is a point for GTN material and metagenomics. And then there is the 16S microbial analysis with mother folder. And there you find two Zenodo DOIS, which would also contain the data. Um, and this is all the files that we will need. So all our FASTQ, FASTQ Sanger files. Um, and it's uh, quite a few of them. So it's 46 uh, files. So we need to change this number to just be able to see all of them. So just change it to something back like 50 should be enough. And then you have all these data sets. And then you could click here to select them all and say, add to history. So this unfortunately doesn't work at the moment. So I need to get the data in, a, in another way, which is also described in the tutorial. So what I do is I take all the URLs and copy them and go to the upload um, dialog. Say paste fetch data just paste all the data here. So you can already select the data type if you want to. So I know that's FastQ Sanger, so I just pre-selected here. It's not strictly necessary. Galaxy can find it out on uh, his own, but so then I just press start. And now Galaxy will download the data for me. So, but normally just go to data, GTN material, um, metagenomics um, and then the mother uh, data set and just add them all to your history. The advantage of this is that we don't duplicate all the data on the on the use Galaxy servers. So maybe one point at uh, this stage here while this is uploading. So the in the data library, um, the folder is called metagenomics, but I just want to uh, emphasize here that what we are doing is not metagenomics. So because we will only analyze one single gene, which is the 16S gene. So this is the other core point of Amplicon or meta barcoding analysis, like done with, with mother data, Chime2 and so on, that you have, that you focus on a single gene that you can easily sequence um, that has some variation uh, but not too much variation because you still need to be able to align it. Um, so just for uh, naming conventions. So um, how about data in Galaxy 2? So if you go to the tool menu, you can just type uh, data in the tool search and Galaxy will search for you all the data two tools and you will basically see all the data 
two tools in um, a section called metagenomic analysis. There are more in a section called CHIME2. So data is also available in CHIME2, which is another suite for, of uh, tools for doing Amplicon uh, analysis and maybe in the future also metagenomics, but it's another point. Um, so, and here we have all the DADA2 tools. So DADA2 is actually an um, R package uh, with a lot of functions. And what we did here is that we took each and every of these functions and took them one-to-one -to, -one to Galaxy. So actually are you doing R here? So you're calling an R function. And also all the parameters and all the documentation have been directly taken uh, from the R function. So the Galaxy tools behave in exactly the same way as the ARM functions. So now I have uploaded all the data sets here. So all are green. So we have 40 data sets. And um, this is quite a lot. So we need to organize them and Galaxy actually allows us to do so, we have a concept called um, collections, um, which can be considered a little bit um, like a folder. So they behave in many circumstances, just like folders. So what you do to do so is you need to tell Galaxy what to organize in a collection. Therefore, we need to select all those data sets. And we can do so by clicking here on this select items uh, button. Then we have all these checkboxes, but of course we don't want to select them all manually, but there is a button, select all. And then we can choose in this selector here what we want to do with them. So, and we want to build a list of data set pairs. So then there opens a dialog that allows you to create uh, this list of pairs or collection of pairs that's um, nomenclature that we use, uh, interchangeable. So, and what you have here basically is two selectors, underscore R1 and underscore R2, which basically identify uh, the, the forward and the reverse reads that we have here. So what we did with our samples or what the person did who prepared the data, so I didn't do it, um, is to um, sequence um, our amplicons uh, in a paired end fashion. So we sequence once from the uh, front into the sequence and once from the back. So we have for each sequence that we amplified, we have actually two uh, reads. And the files that we uploaded are identified either by R1 for the forward read or R2 by the reverse read. So basically by entering text here, we can identify which is the forward and reverse read. There are some pre-selections uh, that you can make, but you can also manually edit this, but most of the time it's not necessary. So then Galaxy will show you, okay, it identified 20 pairs and it will tell you which data sets are paired up. So F3, D3, F3, D3, it's the same, so it makes sense. And in the middle, you see the new data set name. So, and then, uh, we can just choose a name for our collection that will be created. And we just say create collection. This should be super fast. And then we just remove this checkbox uh, by just clicking here again. So just have a look what we did. So we see now we have one item in our history, which is the samples collection, which is a list containing 20 pairs. So each of these 20 pairs is one of the data sets. Um, maybe at this point, I should explain you the, na the naming convention. So what we have here is F3D0. So the number behind the F is, uh, so F means female. Three is the number. So we had at least three replicates. So we, this is female three. And D0 means day zero, day one, day two, day three, and so on. So in, it, with, in each of these samples, we now have our forward and reverse reads. So those are fast Q Sanger files. Um, 
Yeah, just let us know if you don't know or never have worked with FastQ Sango files and want to uh, know more about it, then we can just send around a few links. Um, just have a look here. So this would be an identifier, a unique identifier for this read. Then we have the actual read. And then in uh, the fourth line, uh, we have the qualities of the positions of this read. So this is uh, thread scores. Also here, if you don't know what a thread score is, just let us know. Uh, we will send you the links needed uh, to learn about this. So each position, we have an estimation how sure the sequencer was that the actual uh, nucleotide that is reported is uh, true here. And these gibberish characters here are basically just an encoding of values between 0 and 40, which tell us something about the quality, which is the so-called FRED scores. So just to sum this up, FASTQ files are just blocks of four lines. The first line is the identifier of a read, then there comes the actual sequence, then another placeholder line, and then an encoding of the position-wise qualities of the sequences. And we have this for the forward and the reverse read. So let's get back um, to the history. So what we also should do, of course, um, always is to give the history some name. So let's just, uh, let's say Galaxy Training Academy 2024, da, da, two, and then just save it. So this will help us in the future to find our um, history again. So what we will do now is we basically will start with our um, data two analysis. So we start with our demultiplexed reads. Um, so demultiplexed uh, means so typically you just don't sequence um, the samples separately. Uh, this would be a waste of resources, but you waste, uh, but you sequence all the samples in one run on one machine. In order to do so, uh, in the lab, we add some identifying sequences, um, barcodes to the sequences, so to say, uh, which are also sequenced. And they help us. So for each, each sample gets a unique barcode. Um, so we can know um, which sequence comes from which sample. And this is then demultiplex. It's an extra step. and most of the time you get from the sequencing facility already the demultiplexed reads. Um, otherwise, there are also tools in Galaxy to do the demultiplexing. Um, so we have our demultiplex samples. And what we always should do first is um, to inspect the qualities, what we got. So we need to know what how good the qualities are. And for this, Data2 has a specific tool the plot quality profile uh, tool that we um, load up. So um, what we need to do is we say we want to uh, process all our samples jointly. We have um, paired data. And the input will be the 81 samples. We don't want to aggregate the data. So this means that we will get a separate plot for each of the samples. Otherwise, uh, the tool would create one plot um, containing the data from all samples. And then we have a sample number. Um, so data tool. So this tool will not use all the sequences, but just a random sample. But in this case, for our tutorial, this number is larger than this number of sequences in um, uh, the, the total number of sequences, so it doesn't make a difference here. So uh, let's just run this tool. And I can explain you a little bit more what this means, joint and batch. Um, it's more technical detail how Galaxy takes this. So let's run tool. Um, the data is, uh, the tool run is scheduled now. And we need to wait for this. 
So let's have a look again on the tool form. So what does this mean? So joint means basically that um, Galaxy will take all the data sets and process them in one single job. So, um, and uh, then we have data to decide if we want to aggregate the data or not. If we say we want to process them in batch, then Galaxy will create a separate job. So it's like hitting enter for each of the samples uh, on its own. So creating a single R function call uh, for each of the samples. Um, so the advantage of this would be uh, if you have this option, so we have it here in an, at another stage in the pipeline, uh, that if you have a large number of samples, then they will be potentially processed in parallel. So if there are lots of free resources, then they can run in parallel. So here it's just a single job because we decided to process them jointly, uh, which is fine for the plotting. But if you have a more compute intensive uh, step, uh, like later, um, then batch processing might be an option. So you have more smaller jobs that could run in parallel. So this meets the moment. I will just uh, pause the recording for uh, until this is uh, finished. Okay, now the plotting of the quality profiles um, finished. So what we get is two PDFs, one for the forward reads and one for the reverse reads. So we can have a look at them. So we get one plot for each of our samples. So the sample titles should appear in the end. So we have here from day three to our mock community, um, all the samples. And what do we see here? Um, so first of all, in the x-axis, we have the read position. So we see that our reads have a length of around 250. And in colors, um, you see basically the, the mean quality score. This should be uh, it's a, actually a little bit small. One second. Yeah, the green and orange are the, the quartiles, and then we have also the mean here. So the basic message here is that the quality drops over the read length. So let me just zoom in a bit. What you also could see with really good eyes or a really good screen is that there is actually some kind of grayscale behind the images. So this is kind of a, of a heat map. Um, of the qualities in addition to, to the um, mean and the quartiles here. So we see that there are some positions in some reads. So there is some grayish over here, for instance, that have a really low quality. So higher quality means better, obviously. So it's well chosen scale here. And what we also see how many reads on each sample and this red line uh, can show us um, how many of our sequences have a specific length. So, so far, everything has the same length. So we just have a straight line over here. But let me just go back to automatic zoom. Okay, so this looks quite good, but we see there is a decline in quality towards the end of the read. So this is completely uh, normal for Illumina uh, sequences. So for the reverse reads, uh, we have the same and we see um, that it looks uh, obviously um, different. Um, so we see that uh, from a certain position, we have a quite a strong drop in qualities. So often people say that so up until, so there are as always with thresholds, they are more or less arbitrary. Um, so 20 is chosen often. So we see that we get close to a quality value that is often chosen uh, as a lower bound for um, a good quality uh, read position. 
Um, so why is this? So um, in Illumina sequences, uh, we, we use chemistry, obviously, and uh, the chemicals get used over time, over the sequencing. Um, and this leads to a decrease in quality. Um, so after the forward reads are sequenced, the chemistry is usually exchanged, but the exchange is not perfect. And that's why the reverse reads usually perform uh, much worse than the forward reads. So what we, do we do with this? So what we see now is the forward reads look uh, pretty good, um, but might need a little bit of um, trimming at the end. So this is what we usually do. Um, so uh, the suggestion here would be just to remove the last uh, 10 position. Um, in the forward reads, the reverse reads look much um, worse, in particular to the end. It's not too worrisome, so data uh, can handle with errors, but we don't need to make data's life uh, more difficult than it already is. So we will remove um, some of the positions here, and it looks like that around 160, the drop is, is happening, and this is what we do. Before we do this, we actually need to sort the samples. I also will explain you later why this is the case. Um, so the samples are at the moment um, not sorted, not um, necessarily sorted um, alphabetically. So we can do this with a tool in the collection operations. And there's a tool called sort collection. And we just take the samples as input and sort it alphabetically, run the tool. And this will give us a sorted collection. It's the same data, just uh, sorted alphabetically. So you see now that we have not an ordering by day, but it's an alphabetic uh, ordering. So the point here is that sometimes at one point, Galaxy can um, produce a new collection and Galaxy will always produce collections in alphabetic order. So, and if we don't um, sort the input collection and the newly created collection and we will put them together, then we get a bad pairing. So we will pair uh, the wrong samples. So uh, it turned out to be always the best to um, sort the samples just to be sure. That's what I always do with my data analysis. So uh, let's first truncate um, the quality filter the data. And we do this with another data tool, which is filter and trim. Um, data tool filter and trim. So we again have paired data. Uh, we take the sorted samples as input. And now we can choose loads of parameters. Um, so we have a really uh, low default truncation. So we, we always truncate a read by default if the quality is lower than two. So two is basically, uh, this is really crap. Uh, we don't care about it. So as soon as a read goes lower than two, then Dada will just ignore the rest of the read. Just remove it. Um, and then we have the important parameter truncate read length. So we wanted to truncate the forward read to 240. So we choose 240 here. So you can also uh, trim uh, the start or the end of each read. So you can, so we just do here truncation by read length. Um, what we also want to do is we want to remove low quality reads. Um, and we do this, so this is the suggestion by the Data2 developers, to remove reads that have a certain number of expected errors. And we say uh, two here. So if it's likely that a read has two um, errors, then we just remove it. So and this is chosen, uh, computed from the statistics of the quality scores that we have. So the quality scores basically tell us how likely it is that it is wrong. And from this, we can compute how likely it is to have two errors here. So, so we will do uh, 
also trimming of the reverse reads using different parameters. So we want to use, uh, specify separate filters for the uh, reverse reads. So we choose yes here. Uh, we basically leave everything um, by default and choose a read length of 160. So reverse reads will be truncated at 160. And we also choose the number of expected errors to be two. And the remaining parameters we leave at uh, default. Um, output statistics, we just leave on, which is really helpful in the end to see what happened. So, and then we just run the tool and this will create, um, again, a collection of um, our paired reads, which are then filtered and trimmed. And we will have a collection of the statistics. So we get separate statistics for each of the samples. So what is important at this point? So I told you that we do paired end sequencing of our amplicon. So we have one gene or actually just part of a gene, 16S. There are um, certain regions uh, that are more or less the standard. Um, and what we do here is uh, sequencing of one region of the 16S gene. Um, so what happens? So we have our gene here and um, we sequence it once from the front and once from the back of the sequence. So in the end, we need to make sure that uh, these two segments still overlap. Um, that's an important point. So we will in the end just put those reads together again. And if they don't overlap anymore, so we then we can't uh, put them together anymore. So it's kind of a two-sided sort here. Um, so we want to remove as much of the low quality bases as possible to make data's life as easy as possible. But we should not remove too much because then we just can't puzzle the data together anymore. So typically, you know how long uh, the region of interest is. Um, and then you just need to make sure that the combined length of the forward and the reverse leads is still uh, a bit longer than um, the combined length. So yeah, the combined length of the reads needs to be longer than the length of the region of interest. So something like 20 nucleotides longer. If it's more, it doesn't hurt. It's actually better, but um, otherwise uh, you can't do the full analysis and you can only uh, process forward and reverse read uh, separately, which would be annoying because you lose quite a lot of data. Okay, so this goes now quite fast. So you see here basically, so that our samples are in filter and trim processed separately. So we see that 18 uh, jobs of our 20 jobs are uh, still processing. So you can also look here, you see which is which are already finished and which are still processing. So, and then you can check in the statistics output for each of the samples, how many reads uh, were in the input. So there's a little table and how many reads were in the output. So you can and maybe should check. I will show you in the end a little trick how to do this efficiently because obviously if you have loads of samples, you don't want to check them uh, all manually. So I can do this here for a few and you see that for none of them, we have a really dramatic uh, decrease. So there are obviously some removed, but it's not um, a huge proportion of the reads that um, is filtered here. So then uh, what you should do typically is you should check if the quality is now as you expect it to be. So you run the plot quality tool again, uh, do the same as before, uh, don't aggregate. And now you take the filtered uh, reads as input and you run 
the plot quality profile tool, you get the plots again, and then you can check uh, before and after. So I will pause again until this has been computed and then we continue the recording. So now the second round of uh, quality profile plotting is finished and now we can have a look on the output. So we could go ahead and get this PDF and then the other PDF, but Galaxy actually is a nicer way, nicer way to do this. So we have this uh, window manager. So what you can do is you can just take quality profile before, let's just take the reverse reads before the plotting and then this opens in a kind of new window. And then you can do the same for after the plotting and click the eye icon again and then you can have a look on this uh, side by side. Just needs a moment um, to load. And you see now that uh, read lengths have been shortened as desired to 160. So read qualities until 160s are fine. So we have some drop at the end, but this should be perfectly fine. And you also see that the read numbers have not uh, dropped dramatically in any of our samples. So this is also a way to check this. So let's just close this and disable the window manager again. So all good after. Um, uh, filtering and trimming. So the next thing that we will do is the basically the core of data is the statistic analysis of our sequences. So what data needs to do basically uh, in the approach that is implementing, so the so-called ASV approach, so Amplicon sequence variant, this is what ASV stands for, is to decide for each read and each position if the um, difference that we observe, so difference to other sequences, um, is actually a sequence variation or it is a sequencing error. So that's the, the main problem that we are dealing here with, is our differences that we observe in our sequenced um, Amplicon due to sequencing errors or is it a real true variation? And for this, the ASV approach uh, uses statistics. Um, so data basically learns an error model um, for our sequences for each of the possible transitions. So nucleotide A to nucleotide C. And for each of the uh, positions of our read, it uh, learns um, an error model. So this is done in with the tool called uh, learn error. So for this, uh, we need to, ah, one step back. Um, we, we need to first split our reads into the forward reads and the reverse reads because we need to analyze them separately. So why is that? Because as you have seen when we plotted the quality profiles, uh, we have seen that forward and reverse reads are quite different. So, and this is the main motivation to have different uh, separate error models for each of the tools for each of the forward and reverse reads. Um, so we separate the reads with a tool called unzip, uh, unzip collection. So we take as input our filtered and trimmed reads and we just run this tool, it should be super fast because it doesn't really do any computation. It just restructures our collection. So we now have two collections, the forward and the reverse reads. So it's just a flat collection, each con containing 20 fast Q files. So those are the forward reads and the other collection is the uh, reverse reads. So what I usually do to make my life easier is I edit this collection and add a tag. So I say, okay, this is the forward reads and I add a hashtag before this. I will tell you what this is good for in a moment. Let's save this. And I do the same with the reverse reads. Hashtag reverse, save. So and now I can just see by color, okay, this is the forward and this is uh, the reverse reads. And the nice thing, if you add a hashtag in front of this, um, the so-called name tag, 
those name tags are inherited. So if I run a tool on the forward reads, it also gets the name tag. So I will always know, okay, those are, um, is data that has been derived uh, from my forward reads. So if I now take the data to uh, learn errors tool, as I wanted to do, and I input, so I need to switch to collection input and choose the forward reads. Um, and then I basically just take the default parameters and run. So, and this produces output, which has a tag, forward tag. So I see that this data has been processed from my forward reads. So I do the same again using the reverse reads and I run the tool. So for the forward and the reverse reads, um, we now have <clears throat> uh, two outputs. The one is the error model. So this output uh, has a specific format, which is data uh, error rates. <clears throat> so we know that this is an error rates um, data set of the data2 tool. Um, actually, this is just an, an uh, stored R object, so it's an RDS file. Um, and the other one, the plot, uh, will be a PDF showing us information about the error plot. So again, I will make a pause here in the recording and uh, continue once this is finished, but it should not take too long. So the data learn, learn error step has been finished. Um, so for the data to error rates output, there is not much to see. So there's a short um, summary here uh, that you can check for um, obvious errors, samples have been forgotten or something like this. And then you have the PDF that you should inspect. So what is it showing to us? It shows uh, for each of the possible quality scores and expected the error frequency that we observe. We see, for instance, uh, first of all, the expectation. So the expectation from the definition of what the quality score is. So uh, you need to know about the FRET quality score in order to understand this. So basically, there's a direct mapping of the quality scores from 0 to 40 to the expected error frequencies that you can uh, define. And then we have the observed error rates. These are the dots. And we have um, the fitted model uh, to this. So what we need to check here, basically, is that the values go more or less down for each of the transitions. So we have here for the transition C to A, one error model, for the transition A to C, one error model, and so on. Um, and we need to check if there is a good uh, fit. So here there are some points uh, that are very low. Um, so those are values where we don't have observed any data. So this is fine. So this is what you most of the time. So I never have seen any other plot um, get from data. And we do the same for uh, the reverse reads. So the next thing um, that we need to do is to do the actual uh, computation of the sample um, composition. So we need to define or find out for each of the sequences that we have, if it's a true sequence or if it's a sequence that has been generated by sequencing error. And this is done with the uh, data function. So what we need to do first, um,
is to define if we want to process our samples in bulk batches. So for here, it's fine to choose no. I will explain you again what this means. And then we um, need to uh, give the reads. So we take the forward reads um, and we take the error model for the forward reads. And now we can see that the data set 191, it's the forward reads, fine. And then we run the tool. And we do the same for the reverse reads. Um, da -da. We take the reverse reads and take the reverse reads. Again, you can double check 193, it's the reverse reads. Fine. Run tool. So now let's have a look on the parameters that I just skimmed over. So uh, in the default, if you say process samples in batches uh, is no, uh, this means that all samples will be processed in a single job. So this usually means by a single CPU, one after the other. So um, this might take a while, but has the advantage that um, data can use information from one sample for the others. So if data decides for one sample that the sequence is and has been uh, produced by an error, then for another sample, the um, decision should be the same. Um, so this is not done in the default setting if you say process the samples individually. Um, but data has two other options, pool samples and pseudo-pooling. So pseudo-pooling is a much faster heuristic version of the pooling. So pooling means just uh, exchange information. Um, so this would be an option to do. It takes a little bit more time, um, but might yield you better results. So I usually, I never used it. Uh, so for me, always the default setting worked, but you might uh, want this. So if you want to do pooling, then you need to process the samples jointly. So you need to choose no for the choice process samples and batches. So if, if you say yes, then a separate job will be created for each of the samples. This will be faster potentially. So it might be a good choice for uh, large data sets if you have many samples, uh, but it doesn't allow you to do the pooling. So the sorting step that we did in the beginning is strictly needed if you choose yes here. So then we definitely need um, to choose. Uh, then we don't need to, to, <laughs> to do the sorting. If we say no, so joint processing, um, then we definitely need it. So, and I always do the sorting just to be sure. Then I don't need to think about it here and then I'm fine. So the data step uh, is quite fast and we can inspect uh, the results. So for here, what we do is we can just, um, so it's again an R object that is the output. So we can't see anything here, but what we can do, we can have a look on the standard output of our tool. So we see here for each of the sample, how many uh, reads have been inputted, how many unique sequences this actually represents. So there's a lo loads of duplication uh, in our data set, obviously. Um, and then we see for each of the samples, how many sequence variants have been derived uh, from those set of unique sequences. So the next step to do, so for these two steps, so for the error processing, uh, we process forward and reverse reads separately. And here we do now the merging. So we try to overlap forward and reverse reads. So we try to find a good fit by doing an alignment. So Dada does this for us. And we will get a longer sequence, which is often called contig. So this is done by the tool merge pairs. 
So we need the forward reads um, and the data results for the forward reads, and we need the same information for the reverse reads. So the forward reads um, will be the, well, let me check a second. Ah, the data result for the forward reads, correct. It's 195. And we need the actual forward reads, which will be our unzipped forward reads. Uh, so the first ones that we um, created after the zipping, unzipping. So, and we need the same for the reverse reads, 196. So 196, that's the reverse read, and the same for reverse. Okay. So then we see here the minimum length of the overlap that is required. 12 should be fine here. Uh, so you might, if it gets tight, so if you need it in the beginning to remove a lot of uh, positions, then you might need to lower this a bit, but you can't allow much. Also the maximum number of allowed mismatches, uh, you might need to increase if the overlapping is tough because you sequence too little or you had to remove too much. Okay, output detail table, helpful again for the analysis. It's a good choice to make. So run tool and we do the merging. So in addition to the OTU-based approaches that have been before ASV-based approaches like Mother, we also have a tutorial for this if you want to go through this. Um, the merging actually happened in the very beginning. So what happened there is that you took each of the read pairs, you overlapped them, and then you had the nice property that the overlap happens in the region where you have most errors, so highest error probability. And um, the old OTU-based approach used this then to correct for errors. So they basically have seen, okay, there is a difference. And then they have chosen the position with the higher quality because it's more likely. Okay, anyway, data will merge our pairs now. Until this is done, I will pause the video recording again. So merging pairs um, is finished. So again, this happened in parallel. So you might have noticed that uh, um, that there was a little progress bar showing you when the separate samples have been processed. So that's a clear indication that this happened in parallel. And we have two outputs. Um, the first output is a collection of data to merge pairs data sets. So again, uh, just RDS files, so R data files, which we can't really look into, but we have our detailed output. The other one clicked the wrong one, uh, which is a little table showing us all the sequence variants. So we have our sequence variants in the first column, and then some additional details. So we see uh, the abundance, which is the most important information. Then we see the indices of the reads that have been matched up. We see how many positions are matched and mismatched and how many indels have been found. And I actually don't know what the preferred column is. And we see if it has been accepted or not, which should be true for all the sequences. So that's a big advantage and the biggest difference uh, for the end user between the OTU-based approaches and um, the ASV-based approaches. So in the OTU-based approaches, what you get is basically an anonymous clump, which is called OTU-5, for instance. And that's just an abstract uh, name for something. So if you don't know a sequence or something. So, and for the ASV-based approaches, you actually get a sequence, so the real sequence variant behind this. So this is because for OTUs, you get a set of sequences and you do some clustering. And the OTU5 represents just a cluster of sequences, but you don't know which is the correct one. Um, okay, so the next thing that we do is the step called make sequence table. Make sequence table. 
So input will be our merged sequences. We can choose if we want to sort them by abundance or by the number of samples. And we could length filter the sequences. But sequence length distribution is definitely a good idea, so we leave this checked. So what this now does, it merges um, the information that we have for all the samples. So we had now in the detailed output um, the abundance for each of our sequence variants, but we only had this for one um, sample. So what this now does is it basically uh, just joins this together um, to a bigger table. So this has been finished. So we have two outputs. So we have now our sequence table. So which is a table with uh, the sequence variants in the rows. And we have the abundances for each of our samples. So we see that we have 294 lines. So including the header lines. So this means we have identified 293 uh, sequence uh, variants. And we see how often it has been identified uh, in the samples. And already from just visual inspection, you might notice that, for early, that you have some sequence variants that clearly differ um, between uh, the early uh, states, so let's say those here, including these here, and maybe those here, but it's not clear because on day zero, it's really high and it just dropped. So it's a question that needs to be solved by statistics. So manual inspection doesn't help us here. So the second output is the length distribution. It's a PDF file, which just show you that basically almost our, all our sequence variants um, have a length of 252 or 253, which is exactly what we expect for our data set. If you have a different output and it doesn't match your expectation, um, then you can run the merge sequence table and uh, make sequence table uh, tool again and apply the length filter. Um, yeah, so the last step um, that we need to do in the main part of the analysis pipeline is to um, remove chimeras. So chimeras basically always happen. So chimeras happen if you basically, um, in the sequencing, uh, mix up different sequences in one read. So uh, the sequencing of a read starts and then jumps over to another sequence. So basically you get a mix of two sequences in one read. Um, so data two implements a method um, removed by chimeras, it's called, uh, to remove such chimeric sequences because you definitely want to have them in. The input will be the sequence table and you can again choose for some, uh, for pooling or not. Um, and we will just run this. So the last thing that we always should do is just basically get an overview again, how the numbers of the sequences um, evolved through the pipeline. So if there was one sample or one step that just removed too many of the sequences. And for this, we have a specific tool, the sequence counts, which can extract for each of the steps um, how many sequences we had. So, um, and we need uh, several data sets for this. So the first one um, is we need the collection output of filter and trim, so the statistics. Um, and we will na name this field trim. So this will be the, this will produce a table and we will have one column for the filter and trimming. And this will be uh, contain the numbers before and after filtering and trimming. And then we insert our next step, which was the um, data output. 
So again, this is a collection. So this will be the data output, the forward reads. Let's check again. 95 is the forward reads. So we call this data F, for instance. Um, and we have the, the R. So collection data R 196. It's the reverse reads. Then we have the merging. So basically, we just insert all steps where sequences can be lost. Merging, we have to make sequence table. There actually nothing should happen. Sectab, you can choose whatever name it is. It's just what is shown in the header in the end. And finally, the camera removal, be mirror. And then we just run the tool. And this will give us a table where we can check if in any sample, in any step, too many sequences have been removed. So sequence counting has finished. So we can, should have a look. So we see for each of our samples, so the samples are the rows and each of the steps, how many sequences have remained. And we basically see that in none of the steps, a significant proportion of the reads has been removed. So everything is fine. So the last step of um, data is the assignment of taxonomy. So what we basically do now is for each of our sequencing variants is we look up in reference data sets what kind of species this could be. Um, so what we basically do is we take our final result after the removal of the chimera and we choose a reference data set. So let's just take the silver. So we have several um, available. So silver is the default, what most people use for 16S data for other data sets and other applications, you might want to choose different ones. Um, you have a bootstrap confidence value. Uh, you can make data to try the reverse complement sequence as well. I usually do this. Um, output bootstrap values. Um, you can now do if you want to uh, evaluate them. And you can even assign uh, genus species binomials to the taxonomic table if you want to. You again need to choose a reference data set. And you can say how sure you want data to be to report such a thing. So this is a bit debated if genus or species assignment are at all possible using only amplicons. Um, and I would say you need to be really sure uh, to do so. And I would always say just only on a biggest identification. So if it's an exact match with a reference uh, species, and also here I try the reverse complement, and then you just run this. So this is now finished. And what we get is again, a table with our sequence variants in the rows. And then we have phylogenetic information. So we see that it's all bacteria likely. Then we see that there are quite a lot of firmicutes and so on. So what could be interesting to get a short summary of this, we also see that our genus uh, specification was not really often uh, possible. So we have loads of NAs here. So, but let's get a little summary of this information. So what we can do is we use a tool called group data. By column. 
uh, we take our table as input and we group by column three. So column three is the phylum column. So we group together all unique entries and we want to do is we want to count how often we have each of the entries in column three. So we choose count as operation or count distinct. No, we actually want to count uh, what we have in column three. And this gives us a little uh, basically histogram, how often each phylum was generated. This might give you a set possibility of a sanity check of the results that uh, we got so far. And with this, we basically have finished um, the part where the data R tools are involved. And um, we have now our also it's called feature table. So we know for each feature, for each ASV, how often it occurred in the um, different samples. And from this on, there comes the actual hard part to make sense out of this. So this will be done, we will do in the second part of the tutorial where we use Philosec, which is another suite of R functions um, to get an impression of the, what data is and what this all means. So last but not least, I want to mention that all this that we did is available as a workflow, um, a workflow that is maintained by the IWC, so the Intergalactic Workflow Commission, which is a bunch of experienced Galaxy developers um, that um, create workflows. So you can go to public workflows and just search for data. And you will find a few of them. So you will find all public workflows, but the IW workflows always have this IWC tag here. Um, you can get information here if you want to. You can get a link to the workflow, download it and so on. And you can easily run it. So what we need to do is we need to get the samples as input. Um, we need to input our read lengths for forward and reverse. We need to choose if we want to pool the samples and we need to choose what is the reference data. And with this, we are already ready. So the tricky part is here, how do we know the read lengths uh, for forward and reverse, read, reverse reads? You might need to run the qual plot quality profile tool once to decide for these numbers. Um, and otherwise, let's say you have a really established protocol that you apply over and over, then you obviously know this, um, and that's basically it. And then you just run the workflow. You will see since recently the workflow invocation graph. So basically a little sketch of the workflow and you see what is done at the moment. You, so you see where the, um, processing. So you will see all the steps, so filtering and trimming, plotting quality profiles before and after. You will see the unzipping, error learning, data, the merge pairs, make sequence table and so on. Also the sequence counting and the assigned taxonomy. So that's the complete analysis just in the workflow. Okay, cool. Thanks so far. Uh, and then we will continue with the Philosec part. Okay, so in the first part of the tutorial, we have applied the data pipeline and ended up
library, so you can use R to analyze the data. But luckily, uh, we have since recently um, and so-called interactive tool um, that allows you to interact with Philosec in a graphic way. So before we can do this, um, we, in, for our data, need to prepare um, the sample table, the sample metadata table. So that's more like a little exercise again, how to get uh, the sample metadata. In, in many cases, you will have this already present, some tabular data that you could then just upload. Here we will extract it from the element identifiers of our output collections. So this will be the first uh, that we need to do. And as soon as we have the um, metadata table, we will create a so-called Philosect object that we can then load in the Philosec interactive tool. So that's the outline of what we are planning to do. So in the first part, we will construct our metadata table. So we will construct um, the metadata table from the element identifiers from the collection. So the metadata is, okay, uh, I'd, um, individual number and day number and female or male. So in our test data, we have only males, but we still can extract the data. So these identifiers, we need uh, not, we, we need them in a text file. So this is what we need. Uh, first, we need to extract the element um, identifiers of our output collection to a text file. And there is a tool for this, which is called extract element identifiers. Um, which you find in the collection operations section. So, and we will take the output of merge pairs, uh, which should be the default um, as the input. And then we just run the tool. Okay, when this job is done, you will have a text file that just lists the element identifiers of our data set. So now we want to make this a table. So currently it's just a list with on each line one of the identifiers. And we will do this with the so-called regular expression. There's a tool called replace text uh, in entire line. Um, as input, we will use the output that we have just created, so our uh, element identifiers. And what a regular expression does, it can search for particular patterns, and those patterns follow a specific language. So let's make it easier. So what do we have here? So the pattern actually looks like this. So we have two dots, a D and a dot and a star. So our element identifiers uh, basically have, um, uh, this basically means uh, the following. A dot means there can be any character. So for instance, an F, an M, which would be a female or male but it could be any character. Then there can be another any character, which would be um, the identifier, so the um, individual number. Then we have a D, and then another any character, so it can be anything, but we have more than one number potentially, and therefore we have a star at the end. Uh, and the star means uh, it can be as many uh, as you want of the any character, so to say. So this would be a pattern that matches um, our sample identifiers. So now we just add parentheses, and the parentheses means uh, just says, okay, store whatever matches uh, within these parentheses. So the parentheses itself are not part of the pattern, but they just mark parts. So for instance, this dot 
will match the F and this will be saved. This is what the parentheses do. And the second dot will match the three and the last dot and the star will match the day number. So, and we can now um, access um, these stored elements of our pattern, what they match to, um, and we can access them by using backslash one, backslash two, backslash three. So backslash one will refer to whatever match to this part of the pattern, backslash two to this part, and backslash three to the day number. So this means if we just type uh, backslash one, backslash two, backslash three, um, backslash one, backslash two, D, backslash three, this will just replace the found text with the same. So this is the first thing that we want to do. And then we write the so-called backslash T and backslash T is another special character, which is a tab. So we will insert a tab in the replacement. And we then, we just say backslash one again, backslash T, backslash two, backslash T, backslash three. So what this is doing, it just replaces the text and it will create four columns. The first column will be the text itself. The second column will be the first part matching the pattern um, of the matching pattern. Uh, the second, third column will be the second part that matches the column and the third part, um, the fourth column will be the third part of our pattern. So, uh, and then we run this and we will get a table um, out of our element identifiers. Okay, the tool now also has finished. And what we have now is a proper table, nearly, um, except for the last line, which uh, doesn't match our pattern, so we don't get a proper replacement but we basically separated the components um, of the metadata out of the sample um, names. The only problem um, that is left here that the data type is still text because the tool got text as input, it will create text as output. So, um, but we need to change this and we can do this by just edit the attributes of our data set, go to the data types tab, and change um, the data type to tabula. This again will need um, a little bit um, to do the replacement. Um, the next thing uh, that we want to do is we want to re remove the um, line containing uh, the text mock uh, because um, we don't want to have this in our analysis. Um, and we will do this um, with a tool which has the um, unintuitive name for the application that we want to do is select first lines from a data set. Mm. So we will use uh, the ones that has the head in the, in the back. So the point here, so why has Galaxy two data types with nearly uh, two tools with nearly the same um, title? So the point is that the first one, which you as a user uh, can't really see is a built-in tool. And the second one is one uh, coming from a tool repository from the tool shed. So this is probably version than the other one isn't and has a few more possibilities as well. So the input will be our uh, replace text um, output, and we will say remove the last lines one. So uh, contradicting its name, it can not only select the first lines, but it can also remove the last lines. Okay, and we will just remove the last um, line. So now we have um, the information about um, our metadata that we are interested in. So everything except the mock community. 
what we want now want to do is uh, we have the day numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3. We want, we want to have is a little bit more coarse grained. So we want to know, OK, this is an early sample, this is a late sample. And we will compute this information early um, and late from our data using a simple computation, checking if the day number is greater than 100. So, and we will do this with a tool called compute. Um, compute on rows. Uh, the input will be the output of the select tools. Uh, we don't have header in our data. And we will compute an expression. So we will take the column four, and we can refer, refer to column four by just typing C4. You can always check the help, of course. This will explain everything, should explain everything. And we will check if this is greater than 100. And in order to make this proper, true false uh, value, we need to make this a Boolean uh, value, then Galaxy knows what this is. And the mode of operation will be append. Um, so this means that we will append a new column with the result of this expression. No, we don't want to insert an expression. We just want to run the tool. And then we again need to wait a bit until we get the results. So compute has finished. So we see that we have a new column containing true or false, which is not really nice um, for a graphical res representation. So we would like to have a real text here that can be used in graphics, um, which would be early and late instead of true and false. And also it would be nice to have female and male in the first column instead of F and M. And we will do this again with a replace tool, a different one that we used uh, before. And we will replace text in a specific column. So we can specify, we want to do a replacement, but only in this column. So the first thing is we will replace text in column five. The pattern that we are searching for is just the text true, and we will replace it with late. And then we will do a second replacement in column five. And the pattern will be false. And we will replace it with early. Oops. And then we will do the replacements in column one. We will replace F with female. And we will replace M with male. And then we will run this, and the replacements will be done. So we now have a proper metadata table. The only thing that is uh, really missing is that we don't have a header. Uh, something seems to have failed. Um, ah, we should have done the replacement in column two. Um, so let's just fix this. I just run, click the rerun button. And I will say, instead of column five, I want to do column two. So that's, for me, the primary use of the rerun button. If I messed up parameter choice, then I just can fix this easily without doing all the other parameter choices that I needed to make here. So this needs a while. I can delete this data set. It doesn't need it anymore. And the last thing that we will need then is a header line. And I will do this by the, just creating a file with a header. I just copy pasting it. You will find it in the tutorial, but you can use any text editor, create um, 
a simple text file with uh, with the text sample gender mouse day when separated by a tab. Uh, then copy paste the text here in the paste fetch section of the upload dialog and then just press start. You could select the data type to tabular and then start. Also the upload will need a bit, so I can already run it in parallel. So let's check replace text now worked properly. And the last thing I need to do is I need to concatenate the data sets. I will take the header, which is called unnamed data set, and I will concatenate this with the replace text. Um, and then run the tool. This should start as soon as the upload of the header is finished. And then you will have the proper metadata table with five columns, sample, gender, mouse subject, um, day post weaning, and when. So the next step then is to create a so-called Philosec object, which is basically a file that you could load directly into R. This is what happens in the background, and um, which could be treated uh, by Philosec. So we have data coming from data, um, and there is a tool to create such an object that we need, Philosec. And it's called create Philosec object from data to another important data type in this domain. So um, Amplicon analysis um, or metagenomics is biome files. So you could also create Philosec objects from biome files. But we have a data table. Um, so this is what we will do here. Um, so the sequence table will be the output of removed by Mirara de novo. This should already be pre-selected. The taxonomy table uh, will be the output of assigned taxonomy. And the sample table will be the output of concatenate uh, data sets. So we, um, yeah, that's basically it. And then we will run the tool. So as soon as our concatenation is done, again, the next stop, which now depends on this, will also start. And we will end up having our Philosec object. So you, in most cases, I guess you won't need to do such extensive pre-processing because you always will have a metadata table. But this is a cool exercise to show you uh, how to do um, such text or tabular processing in a reproducible way. So because now, if you have a different sample, you can use the same steps, uh, steps. So if you decide to do more sequencing and have more individuals, then you can use the same workflow um, uh, on more samples. So no problem with this. This is the big advantage here. So um, as soon as the Philosec object is finished, we can then use this. And we will we can run the main Philosec tool, which is Philosec Explore Microbiome Profiles, which has a simple input, single input, which is the Philosec data set. Um, and then you run um, the tool. And these interactive tools work a little bit different. You can interact with them. Um, and um, you will find all your running interactive tools in the in a section of the user menu. So you have here the active inter, active interactive tools um, and you find could also reach this directly uh, using this link. But in general, you just go here or um, yeah, that's basically it. I should end up over here.
So while having paused the video recording, um, I retried this after create Filosec sec object tool finished, and then it worked. And now I see the Filosec tool um, in the list. So it's better to just wait in this case until the input for our interactive tool is finished. And then you will have um, the running interactive tool. And you can interact with this by just clicking on the link which will open a new tab for your interactive tool, loading the um, Filosec um, tool, which is a so-called um, Shiny app for visualizing um, data. Like uh, alpha diversity, you can get network plots, you can do ordination, heat maps, you can plot trees if you have trees included. You can transform your data, you can filter your data, and so on. So what we uh, want to do first is we want to visualize alpha diversity, which describes the diversity of the group. And there are many, many different possibilities to measure the diversity. I will uh, show you um, that Phytosec allows you to um, work with many of them. So you go to the alpha diversity tab. And um, what we will do is we can now select, OK, what we actually want to plot. So on the x-axis, we want to uh, plot the day. And we want to color by the when column. And for the alpha measures, we want to have Shannon and Simpson. So actually, we don't want Chao, but I don't know how to remove it. Um, so that seems to be one bug. So I can't find out how to remove measures here again. So you probably would need to, to reload. But anyway, what you have here is uh, now a plot of the Alpha of different alpha diversity measures, and then you can now compare them by um, uh, if they are early or late, and you can see if there are differences. Um, and you can uh, play with this, of course. So you can s plot the different early and Date samples, and you can have a comparison. You also can change plotting. You can change the height. You can choose different formats. And you can download the file to your hard um, disk. So you can customize your plot interactively until uh, you're happy with this. So the question that you could answer with such an alpha diversity plot is if there is any obvious systematic difference uh, between your samples, in this case, early and late samples. And um, from the plots, I would say that there is at least nothing obvious uh, here in the plot. Then another thing that you can you often want to look at is an ordination plot. Um, so we have here quite high dimensional data, which we would like to visualize in some way. And uh, what we want to have here is, is what we would like to see for our data is an so-called NMDS plot, which is non-metric multidimensional scaling um, that can or tries to represent pairwise dissimilarities between our samples in a low dimensional space, so 2D, so we will get the 2D space even if the original data is uh, much higher. And the advantage here is that it emphasizes the rank, so it's a rank based dissimilarity measure. So we will go to the ordination uh, tab. Uh, we will display the samples. Method will be NMDS. Um, the distance measure. Uh, we will leave transformation prop and color will be when. 
So this should look then uh, like this. And what we at least can answer here is that there is a clear separation between the early and the late sample. So what we see, um, what we have answered with the alpha diversity measure, that the diversity within each of the samples, so the diversity of the early sample and the diversity of the late sample is not different, but the samples itself, they are different. So we see here a clear separation between the early and the late samples. Another interesting thing could be taxonomic abundances. So you want to, to have um, a bar plot. So x-axis will here be samples. Um, color will be family. Uh, and facet color when <laughs> and then you click rebuild graphic and you will get the uh, graphic output. So what we see here immediately that it's really hard to read um, because the color palette is reduced and we cannot distinguish the different colors. We need to filter the data for displaying this more in a more useful way. So we go to the filter tab and we select um, the following uh, table. We will say taxa min um, to 500. So we will filter if there is less than 500 uh, for a corresponding sample. Execute filter. Uh, and you can see here a bit what changes in the data with the histograms. And now we can go to bar again. And we can now X axis sample color will be again family um, and facet color will be when and then we will rebuild the graphic and now we have this for our reduced data and it's a little bit more um, helpful. And here we could uh, try to answer the question, um, if there is an obvious change in the taxonomy between the early and the late um, samples. Um, and yeah, not really. Uh, we can't see anything with this um, plot. So there are many, so besides Philosec, which is an interactive tool and has loads of possibilities, and I would um, refer you to the Philosec uh, tutorial um, in order to show you more possibilities, what you can do here. So it's not a tutorial of the training network it's, uh, on the Philosec website to uh, see more of the possibilities that you have with Philosec. Um, there are many different tools available. Uh, maybe most prominently, there is uh, the more standard tools called AMPVIS to generate um, publication ready tools. Uh, plots for count data. So you have also heat map tools, you can filter and so on, but it's more like a tool way. The, the big advantage of the Philosec interactive tool is that you can interactively polish the plots. So you can change sizes, you can change font sizes, colors, and so on interactively, while for those more classic tools, uh, you always need to rerun the tool which might require quite a bit of time to get them nicely. But the advantage again is if um, you managed um, to get nice plots, you can reuse the settings for different uh, analysis. So you can build a um, workflow out of the AMPVIS uh, tools, which is more difficult for Philosec, uh, the Philosec interactive tool. 
So thank you very much for your attention. Um, uh, questions, of course, are welcome. Um,